Hi folks, welcome to another feature boot camp with Script Camp. This is sort of the bread and butter of our whole program here. This is an eight week program where you will go through it from beginning to end and write an entire movie. This is basically how to write a movie 101. This is week zero, which is the introductory class. So you do not have to currently be enrolled to be here and watching along with us. And if you're watching on one of our other platforms like YouTube or Facebook, then um, thanks for, for being along for this and feel free to check out our library of other videos that we have on YouTube if you want to get a better sense of the kinds of classes that we do. Um, but this will always sort of be the bedrock of the script camp kind of thing. We're a Discord community that is intended to take you from idea to finished draft to more polished script, basically as far as you want to take it. Um, and uh, we have programs for pilot and for feature and coming up we're adding a whole new boot camp just for writing novels. So there's plenty of great stuff to do here. Let's look at our just basic uh, couple slides. Or remember to check your um, audio. If you are having issues, here's some suggestions for ways to diagnose problems with your audio. The main thing is just keep that uh, the little gray microphone icon next to your name in, on Discord. It indicates that you are muted. If you're watching on something that's not Discord and you'd like to join us for this live interactive class, because all of our classes are live and interactive, then you should come join our Discord server scriptcamp.net is the place to go. Um, so great little gray icon, uh, microphone icon means that you're muted. If you click it again, it will take it off and you can speak. But for the most part, we'll be using a text channel that you can find on the left-hand side of your Discord window. It is called general chat right underneath where it says um, at the bottom of our dis discussion tab, you can see one uh, that is called, oh wait, do we have a text channel for this class? Maybe, oh. maybe we can probably just rename the short film chat from yesterday. Yeah. Like they can, um, so we, the think with the stream, it has to be like a other channel, but you oh, could okay. have them type in the text channel for the voice chat. Oh, or right. Okay. Ex if, you, if you want, if it, it's up to you. Just let me know. Uh, but b basically, there will be at least one that's just like the stream people, <laughs> st the, the stream, stream people's people. channel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to, maybe we can just make a, a dedicated channel for them or something. Okay. Hopefully with some evocative artwork that portray them as some kind of water-dwelling monster people. Um, okay. So yeah, let's just, let's use the, uh, this is a new feature that Discord has, but if you mouse over general chat, you'll see three little icons. One of them is create invite, one of them is edit channel, and one of them is a word bubble. So if you click on that, it should open up the text for this class that you can use. Oops, I spelled class wrong. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, we'll we'll use that for now. Um, and uh, try, yeah, try to try to remind me to check that because that's kind of hard to find sometimes. Um, but uh, yeah, let's use that for most of your questions and comments in the class today. Um, and uh, of course, there will be many opportunities to also unmute. And so remember, to click that gray microphone in the bottom left to unmute yourself if you need to talk about your idea or explain further or anything like that. Okay. Um, what is Script Camp? So I mentioned we are a screenwriting community. So this is a Discord server. It's Discord is like uh, not only for voice chat, it's also basically a social media type of uh, setup where you will be able to participate in many different discussions or writing groups. Um, we have lots of free classes and events and workshops and some paid ones as well, like further classes in this course are all going to be part of the boot camp. So you must be a member in order to attend those or you can buy the course on its own if you really want to, but the best value you're probably gonna get is from membership. So you can go to scriptcamp.net and sign up for a free trial. You get two weeks to try everything you want, go to as many classes, as many workshops as you would like, and then um, decide if you wanna keep it or not. So a little about me, I've been a pro working screenwriter since 2017 when I broke in with my script called Peter and the Wolves that was in the Launchpad Contest Top 10, nickel quarterfinals and got me a bunch of meetings in town. Um, since then, I, I've written on Shudder's Creepshow series back in 2019. I've been on a couple lists, which you can see here, and I have a thriller script that's set up at a major production company in town. I teach the boot camps and weekly writer's labs. Um, what are these boot camps? These are, oh, black text on black background. I should swap, change that. But these are courses that are intended to take you from that first draft to, or sorry, from idea to first draft um, for the most part. So these are two hour weekly meetings um once every you know uh weekend we have a meeting for the boot camp you can try doing multiple boot camps at once though we don't recommend it um usually you should probably just be sticking with one at a time because it's a pretty condensed period with which to write a pretty complex document so 
you should um, sign up for something you think that you can actually accomplish, but the goal is not to write something amazing, it's to finish something and just to start to build those skills and put you on the path to being a professional writer. So this is eight weeks for features, six for TV, six for a stage play, which we have recordings of that course on our video library for members. We have uh, four weeks for the pitch boot camp as well. You can find a few of those on YouTube. Four weeks for a horror thriller boot camp, which we did. We did a sci-fi boot camp. And coming up, we are doing... Well, we just started short film, so four weeks for short film, and we're gonna doing 12 weeks. We're going to do 12 weeks for the novel camp. So plenty of different programs here, plenty to do. And let's look at the overview for this upcoming boot camp. So this one that you're in right now is the free introductory session. That's going to kind of be a preview of everything that you're going to do and a look ahead at the kinds of things to expect and to prepare for. And also a good place to get that early feedback on your idea and start to get um, the guidance that might help shape it into something that's a more viable or just a stronger feature. Um, week one is going to be on logline. So you need to make sure you get that one sentence expression of the idea really, 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 really clear in your head so you know what it is that you're trying to accomplish with the movie, what is the appeal of the movie, and also you want to figure out what your sort of comps are, your comparable titles that are going to tell, help clarify for people what your intention is with the tone, with the type of story that it is. So we're also going to be working on this thing that we call the sketchbook, which is, does not have to be literal actual drawings, but it's like a just blank document where you're going to keep all of your unsorted ideas that pertain to the script that you're going to be writing. So um, <clears throat> I would actually probably start that in this class or right now if you haven't already. Just a place to be gathering and keeping all your ideas in one single Google document so that you are not going to be losing stuff or keeping stuff in different files. <coughs> it's important to simply stay organized and a big part of the course is teaching you not only just how to conceptualize and format a script but how to stay organized and to create the plan that you will need to execute these things on a consistent basis and at a high level of quality. So maybe start with that kind of sketchbook document today. Start categorizing and gathering all of your ideas and um, keeping them in the same spot so that we can start to build out a picture of everything that could go. It's like a collage of everything that could be in the movie. Um, week two is on outlining those broad strokes. That's like a sentence for the major plot events of the movie in the general order that they occur in. Next, you're going to expand that into a scene card outline, which is going to be full paragraph for every single scene, as well as the exact page numbers that you anticipate or, or kind of can guess that it will take place on. That's to sort of, again, help you stay very organized and to essentially figure out a plan where you will know what happens on every single page of the movie before you even start writing it. And it's tough to write a full comprehensive set of scene cards, which is why the whole first half of this program is all pre-writing and planning and outlining to make sure that once you actually start those pages, then you can get your momentum up and keep it high and not get stuck in the weeds on you don't know what happens next or you don't know how to get to the next moment. Um, four, five, six, seven, and eight, those are all writing. So we're gonna be, the second half of the class is on writing the script. So you will be writing 20-ish, 20, 20, 20, 25 pages a week, um, and which is just about four pages a day if you only write on weekdays. And you will try to finish the whole thing by October 16th. And that is the sort of the, I guess, if you count week zero and the week that follows our last class meeting, it's more like 10 weeks, which is plenty of time to write a full length feature film. Um, and if you have not yet written a feature, this might be a good time to write your first one or to learn these skills and techniques. And even if you don't finish or you end up with a big mess at the end or whatever it is, then hopefully you will have at least learned from those mistakes in, in the next feature that you write and the next one and the next one, then you will be able to use those organization tactics and those skills that you have just built um, from just doing this in order to make the next one even better and more organized and so on and so on. Um, any questions about the overview of the course before we go on? Okay, no questions, let's keep going. Um, so if you need feedback on your script, this not it's not included in the boot camp that you will get like a full set of notes at the end. Um, uh, I used to try to do this and it was just impossible for the number that we had to do. So um, you are going to be finishing a script in this course and then what you do with it afterwards is up to you. And there's plenty of ways to get feedback on this from other students. You can participate in the table reads or the script swaps which are often going to be better than just posting it somewhere and saying, hey, everyone, someone give me feedback on this. It, you know, if you do favors for someone else, give someone else feedback on their script, then maybe they'll be able to organize a trade with you. Or these, these swaps and things like this are a good way to just get that good feedback. You can also stop by, if you're a member, we have Writer's Lab, which is Saturdays, and you can bring up to five pages 
of something you're working on or something that's finished if you want to get extra feedback on it that way. We have a, or we've attempted to set up a new rewrite bootcamp recently, but didn't get enough sign up. So if you want to sign up for a rewrite course, once we get enough members, we are open to doing that. Um, there's also, uh, if you want to buy coverage from me or buy notes from me after the script is done, you can do so, scriptcamp.net slash coverage. And if you are a member, then you will get a huge discount off of this. So um, consider doing that, but you don't have to. There's lots of other ways to get notes for free. So it's just one of your several options. How to enroll, go to scriptcamp.net slash classes and you can buy the course by itself or scriptcamp.net slash membership. Um, we also have a poll that we can put in the chat that you can just uh, click the little yes or the, you can vote in the uh, this little poll. Thanks, Nacho, in the feature bootcamp chat on the left-hand side of your Discord window. Um, and you can cl click those little numbers if you plan to enroll but have not yet and you can just get instant access to all of your, the private chat channels and things like that, video library links um, and uh, just get the benefits of being a member right away. All right, um, that's a breakdown of the different membership options. We also have yearly memberships now, which are, if you get, you there's another discount. It's like 40% less than the regular rate, which is uh, only $30 a month for all of this if you buy yearly. So that is an option on scriptcamp.net as well now too. All right, so we have to look at what are our goals as a writer before we go into this. I mean, this course, I should say, is taught with the assumption that you want to be a professional feature writer in Hollywood. Um, there are many sort of different subcategories of that and different ways that you can do that. Some people want to, for instance, write and direct their own movies. And if that is their primary goal, then there's a certain way to go about that. And there's certain considerations when approaching that. There's some people that want to be the creator of an animated series, for instance, and or like, an, like and they want to create animations, in which case, again, that has its own sort of path and its own sort of things that you should consider or do in your own ways that you should like network with that and uh, network in that world and create connections in that world and be trying to move your career forward in animation as opposed to live action. If you want to be a pro TV writer, that is its own other path as well. We have a pilot course that goes deeper into how that works. But this one in particular is geared towards, I want to write studio level feature films in Hollywood. So it's okay if that's not quite your goal, but maybe we can just weigh in now and say what exactly your goal is and how that uh, you want to approach that. Um, and what are you hoping to accomplish? What is your sort of far in the distance goal um, in, in terms of writing uh, your, for a career? Um, anyone can feel free to weigh in and tell us what are some of your goals and how do you think you might be able to get there? Um, I, my goals in general right now are uh, learning the structure um, I, I just took the TV pilot boot camp and, uh, at the beginning of the class really didn't know how it would end up. And now I have a 30 page pilot that I'm really happy with. And, uh, I am kind of done with noodling on things and, and like I have been on previous scripts that just become half written nothings. And I'd like to continue to have fully written somethings. Awesome. Yep, that's the best way to improve. Keep reading, keep writing, and finish things. If you just do those three things, you will not get worse. <laughs> it's, I don't think it's possible to get worse if you do those three things. So even if it's very incremental, you will get better just by finishing things and then moving on and finishing the next thing. One of those main skills that we have to work on as screenwriters is just the skill of letting go. And you finish something, now it's time to move on to the next. That's pretty much all you have to do. Thanks for the comment, Josh. Uh, anyone else? Gray says, I hope to create worlds and characters that people can find comfort, hope, and understanding in. Okay, well, that's a very uh, emotionally specific goal, which we don't see all the time, but that's great. I mean, that can that's nice that because that can be accomplished in a couple different ways. Um, you know, if, you can, if you're just hoping to sort of create worlds and characters, for instance, then there's always short stories or web comics, or there's, there's all kinds of ways to, to do that outside of writing fe features, but... Um, features can certainly accomplish that too. So thank you for that. Was there more comments in the text? Hope says, I'd like to write a good feature film script based on my novel. My dream is to see it on the big screen. Okay, so an adaptation. Um, that is, yeah, ad adapting things is, is worth a class on its own that we are, we've toyed around with adding an adaptation class before um, and haven't quite done it yet, but I would like to add that someday. So that, that might be helpful uh, a little more specifically for what you're looking for, but 
when writing something as complicated as an adaptation of a movie, often it's good to approach it as if it's a brand new thing that's like inspired by the book that came before. Um, so maybe this course might give you some pointers for just how to create a feature from scratch that um, would help in the construction of an adaptation, even if it's like um, the, the way you go about it would be slightly different. You'll at least sort of build the foundational skills for how to write a movie at all. Um, Marcus says, screenwriting and novelist goals, I want to do both. Hey, me too. Um, yeah, that's why we are adding that uh, new novel writing course that starts in September. So this this course will be done, and you'll be right on time to start the novel course if you want to do that. Uh, Hope says, I'm a Russian writer. My novels and stories are translated into English, but now I see I need to write it myself. It's a challenge. Oh, yeah, for sure. If it's Especially if you're a non-native speaker, the journey to writing Hollywood, professional Hollywood stuff is going to be much more difficult um, because you have to write at a native English level in order to have a shot at doing this. Um, but that's okay. I mean, there's plenty of non-English speakers that have, or non-native speakers, ESL speakers, I should say, that um, have had successful careers in Hollywood. It will just, it'll add an extra difficulty, but if you overcome it, people love the sort of different perspectives that different um, vo voices from all over the world bring to Hollywood. So it is very valuable in some ways, too. Anyone else? Feel free to unmute and speak out loud if you'd like. Okay, maybe that's everyone for now. That's okay. Um, but uh, let us know in the chat if you have additional goals or um, some other approach to this that you're trying to take. So um, the the basics of this sorry, are... Sorry, oh, uh, Go ahead. Sorry, Connor. Uh, you, do you good. speak to me right now? I can quite I, hear you. I can hear you. No, no, I didn't know who we're talking about right now. So I didn't know if the question was directed at me or somebody else. Oh, no, not at you. It was just to the whole room, just asking if anybody wanted to share their goals for oh. being a writer. That, you're, oh, okay, you're okay. Gotcha. Okay, so... <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so um, ground rules for the boot camp. Um, uh, you want to get used to the idea of sharing work early on and with, with everybody, even at these early stages. It can be difficult to hear that your idea might just have problems inherent to it from these early stages, so you have to get used to hearing this stuff. Two of the big skills that writers need to work on to work in, you know, to go from aspiring amateur to working professionally in Hollywood is this thing I mentioned of the skill of letting go. Um, no one project should be your golden goose that you put all your, you know, all of your hopes and dreams onto um, because you will have to write a lot of scripts to do this. Even a fantastically written script is not enough to get it made. Um, even if you do the almost impossible task of writing a fantastic script, which, by the way, most people will never, ever do. Um, but if you do, then um, that's not always even enough. So the thing is, like, it might be the wrong place and wrong time. It might be that it seems too expensive to everyone to make. It might be that it's just too niche. It might be that you it, it is great, but then you give it to one person and they say, it's not really for me. And then it goes nowhere. And then, it, like, writing a great script is not enough. So you need to have the ability to write unlimited great scripts in order to do this. So work on the skill of letting go and saying, I've done all I can on that one. I need to move on to the next one in order to continue to improve and to build my portfolio. So try to th be thinking of that. The other big thing is the skill of, you know, to thickening your skin and, and being ready to hear opinions that you might disagree with or that might be slightly upsetting even at the early stages somebody might say something like i don't know i don't think there's an audience for that idea or they might say something like um you know i i'm not sure who this is for or things like that and you have to just sort of compartmentalize these things and say okay maybe this person doesn't see my vision but this is not a place for me to debate them getting notes is not an invitation for you to debate with the people who are giving you those notes it's a Ideally, it is a person who is offering you their expert analysis and opinion. Maybe they're not always experts, but whatever. They are offering you their time at the very least. And the respectful way to deal with that is to say, thank you for your time. I will consider how I can use that. Whether you agree or disagree is almost irrelevant. So try to work on also the skill of gracefully receiving notes and not fighting with the people giving them to you. Oops, excuse me. But um, the, uh, the essentials of this are, remember, moving on and thickening your skin. Those are two of the key things to know going in. Um, not that we'll be giving you mean notes or anything, but just, like, be prepared. This is, you will hear a lot of stuff that 
is not super encouraging when you do this. Most of the time you'll put a lot of work into something and you'll only get negative responses to this. It's not like your parents will stick it up on the fridge with a magnet. It's like, this is uh, really challenging to get good at. Learning how to write movies well is like learning how to play the violin and that it's difficult to actually get the instrument itself to make a clear, consistent sound. It's not like playing the piano where you can just come up and press two keys at once that are one key separated from each other and, oh, that's a chord. That's like playwriting, basically. Playwriting, it's pretty easy to just start and to just put something up and just get it made. And, like, uh, it's not easy to make an amazing play in the same way it's not easy to make an amazing song on the piano. But you see what I mean? Like, it's easier to just make it sound like music. But with screenwriting, it's a little different. There are a lot of little rules, and there's a lot of little things that you have to just be aware of, and you're not going to know about them unless you read lots of scripts. So you absolutely have to do that. Um, you should also use your real name if you're going to continue in the course past today, or if you truly do not want to use your real name, then you can use just something else that is a real name, like your middle name or nickname or something like that. But you can't use screen names in the industry, so you have to either have your pseudonym or like you know, your writing name or use, just use your real name is what I recommend. Um, you can right click on your username to change it or we can just change it for you if you want. But essentially you can keep it whatever you want for this class, but if you're gonna continue past the intro class of a bootcamp and actually be in that bootcamp, then you gotta use a real name. Um, all right, more ground rules. Uh, don't do true stories, adaptations, rewrites, or anthologies in this course. Um, those are just things that will all probably take you more than the eight weeks of this class will uh, afford. And just the ability to write a brand new original feature in eight to 10 weeks is one of the key cornerstone skills of being a pro feature writer in Hollywood. So as this is a class that focuses on that path and on that specific journey, that is how we are approaching this. So try to get used to writing these movies in eight to 12 weeks, you know, like two to three months at least for your a good solid first draft, um, maybe another month or so for a rewrite, and then maybe, I don't know, one more month for another rewrite. So that's like, what, four or five months for the whole thing? done if you're able to move on from that and do it again and you're writing two or maybe even three scripts a year that's a pretty good way to approach things um and uh like to start to build up to a portfolio that you would consider being able to enter into contests and also share with people so you try to be writing you know two to three features a year at the least maybe more um don't write time travel just trust me especially if you're newer at this it will just be a huge headache and you just don't want the majority of the notes that you get to be asking what on earth is going on in the script because the more that we have to work to figure out, wait, wasn't that a paradox with that timeline? And because you made that little change or you, there was a typo on that page and that like all these things in these early drafts are, just become so much harder to keep straight and harder to keep organized and harder to avoid uh, plot holes and stuff like this. You just don't want the majority of your notes to be on other stuff besides characters, story, scene work, these things that we can really get the most out of the feedback on these things. Um, to that end, you probably don't want to write a historical story just because those often will require that extra research time. If you already have a background or basis in that subject, it might be fine, I don't know. Or if you just really, you love you, all you ever read is you know um, Victorian romance books, so you really want to write a Victorian romance movie and you have a good you know background in that, then sure, okay, go ahead. But it's I just don't recommend it because it will require more background research. Um, be careful with stories that involve ideas like clones, parallel universes, extensive use of montage and flashback, unless your movie is fundamentally kind of uh, using flashback structures all throughout, like you have multiple timelines, or I mean, and even that is like really tricky to get right, so be careful there. But, um, you know, just try to write the most linear beginning, middle, end story you can. If that sounds limiting to you, you should just know it's not really limiting at all, but, you know, if if you are newer at this, try to avoid using these fancy techniques that might get in your way and just prevent you from writing a script in eight to 10 weeks. You're trying to just pick an idea that you can write in eight to 10 weeks because the, the, the core of this is you're trying to write something and finish it and move on to the next thing. That's what the bootcamp is sort of about. So I will be suggesting that you move towards ideas that seem more feasible within eight to 10 weeks. But it's a great time to take just a big swing and try something wacky or crazy or fun something that might not take extra research, but might be something you're like, well, that would never get made. No one would ever make that, or I'm the only one that would go see that. This might be a fine time to do that. You're not trying to write something that will sell. You're trying to finish a script. So look at this as practice. This is like going to the gym, you're lifting weights, and you are just you know running laps around the track and trying to get better at these fundamental skills of screenwriting. Don't get too attached to the script. 
use an idea that you are not as attached to and be prepared to just use this as like that, you know, these are the laps, this is the practice. Um, you're not going to have to rely on this winning a contest or getting an agent or selling or anything like that. You're just here to improve as a writer and to learn this craft. Looks like we have some comments in the chat. Hope so it says my name has 21 letters, that's why I go by its translation. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, you can always use an, a nickname or um, some some other version of your name if you want. Whatever is easiest for you and is a name. Um, okay, so let's uh, finish the ground rules, then I'll take questions on these before we move forward. So if you don't have an idea yet, just think of what is some mashup of concepts you've always wanted to see, but you never thought it would get made. Um, I already told, I already mentioned this one. Get used to sharing work at the early stages. Um, oh yeah, these. I think there's some repeats on here. <laughs> That's okay. All right. So hopefully we get the idea. You're you're trying to just pick something that you can finish in the time span of the class and have fun with it. Something you can just have fun with and something you can complete. Let me take questions on um, the ground rules. Anyone have any questions on these? Okay, no questions, let's keep going. Um, so this is the steps. We start with logline. Oops, well, we're not on scene cards today. So we start with logline. We go to sketchbook, story beats, scene cards, and then we do what's called, you go to pages, meaning you stop pre-writing and you move into actually staging and formatting scenes on your so screenwriting software. Um, so there are four steps before we even get to that. You do not even need to download a screenwriting software until we are almost halfway through this course. We really emphasize this extremely methodical, organized process of figuring out what the movie is first, what is the appeal, what is the promise, what is at its core, then you expand outwards into a sketchbook that will give you lots of just unsorted ideas of the places you could go, the things you could do, the characters we could meet, the lines of dialogue we could have, the kinds of set pieces we'd want to see. Then you're going to organize that into your story beats, and then you move into your scene cards, which is, you know, that full paragraph for every single scene in the movie. So by the time you get to pages, you know what happens on every page of the story. Um, will this draft be good? No. It's okay if it's not good. The goal is not to write something good. And the goal, like any individual script, the goal is not to make it good, really. It's to write something that works, that you did your best with, and that you've improved as much as you currently can, which would be like, you know, three drafts, more or less. I wouldn't really go beyond three drafts unless you're being paid. Um, we're writers because we have good ideas and we do believe in them, but to become, become a working screenwriter, you do have to just untether yourself from your ideas. This is a very collaborative medium in which you are not the final voice or the final arbiter by being a screenwriter, unless you're directing the movie or funding the movie yourself. And even then, sometimes there are other cooks in the kitchen, so to speak. But in the best case scenario, as a feature writer, your idea will be bought and developed and rewritten and then directed and then edited and then marketed and then maybe reshoots will be done. There's just, you. your control over the final product is not 100% yours, and or the, I should say, the, you do not have full control over the final product, um, and you can't get too attached, or you will just set yourself up for disappointment after disappointment. You will see huge A-list screenwriters who are like, oh yeah, that, that movie, I hated how it turned out. It was nothing like what I wrote all the time, and you just have to understand that that's part of this, and that unless you're writing and directing, or you are writing, uh, I don't know, adaptations of your own hit musicals, plays, or novels, things like that, then you will just be ceding a large amount of control in screenwriting, and that's kind of just okay. You have to be okay with that. Um, and uh, until you get there, take those big swings now. Like, the stuff that you write now, you don't have to answer to anyone on. You're just writing it to get the words done and to improve your skills. You don't have to worry about, is this going to be a hit with all four quadrants of the audience? You can do what, this is the time that you should use to write whatever you want and figure out the kind of writer that you want to be. Um, so ultimately, your goal is just to become a generator of unlimited ideas. It's not to have written one good script. You need to develop those skills necessary to execute these 80 to 85-ish to 120-ish page long stories consistently on a quick time frame and with this high level of quality. So don't worry about writing a great script yet. That will happen in the future. It will take many years of writing. It takes most people about 10 years from when they first pick up writing to when they start getting meetings. This is work. It takes a long time, and no one starts out good at it. Um, I think I've already gone over most of this stuff. It's your, basically, it's just your job to write a bunch of bad scripts to get to the good ones. 
Um, here's a bunch of myths and assumptions. I don't have to go over all of these today, but maybe I'll just pick out a few. The first one is you need a degree or a film school or internship or class or workshop or film studies degree or any individual course or class, including this one, to succeed as a screen editor. You do not need any of those things. You do not need to take classes like this. This is not a guru course that's like, this is the only way to break into Hollywood. This is a place to workshop and increase your skills. And you don't actually need any kind of certificate or like certification to do this. You could be an ex-convict and get a job as a screenwriter if you are really good at writing movies and have a fresh perspective and a fresh voice and a strong command of cinematic elements on the page and great dialogue and these things. No one cares about your college degree. No one cares where you went to school. No one will even ask. Um, networking and nepotism. Sure, there's a lot of that. Um, and we can see those that some people even call everything nepotism. They're like, that's just some guy you met at a party who gave you that job. And yeah, sort of, um, that's networking. That is the a big part of this job is you probably have to move to Los Angeles eventually. You don't have to right away, but when you are ready to start meeting people here, and uh, this is a very, very social job. This is not a secluded type of writing that you can do all by yourself at home. You have to be willing to go to bars and parties and meeting with assistants. And especially if you're in your 20s or early 30s, then it is a good time to move here and to start to meet people of the same ages that are trying to move up in the world of management and um, agenting and production producers, people like that. They will be at their um, these events and things like that, and you have to just be willing to make friends with these people and meet their friends. And this is a super social job with a lot of interaction that you need to do to build a network of people who might read you or pass your script to someone. Or um, you know, it's not the type of writing you do all alone in your basement by yourself. You, you kind of have to move to Los Angeles eventually to, to do this. Um, but don't worry about that until you're fantastic at writing. The first step is to become fantastic at writing, which takes the longest time of any of the steps. So until you're like, I have three to five amazing scripts that I'm really proud of that I'm to I totally nailed, I would not think about moving to Los Angeles yet. There's, unless you, know, you want to start networking early, you want to work on set perhaps, or maybe you want to go the assistant route to work in TV. Um, then you can move to Los Angeles the sooner the better um, because those jobs are hard to get and will not get any easier and you're not going to get them unless you're here. Um, some other, just a couple key points on here. Um, which one? Which ones should I highlight? Uh, you can... Um, how about this last one? I think most of these are pretty self-explanatory. I think I mentioned already you don't have that much control over the final product. This idea that bad movies are written by bad writers, I've kind of touched on. I mean, the idea that most of what we see on screen, it has been rewritten and reworked by producers, additional writers, rewrites, directors, editing, casting, everything that changes the product from when it is a script to when it goes to the screen. There are like dozens and dozens of other hands that it must go through to get where it goes. The people that you that are writing movies on the, that we're seeing on the big screen are at the absolute top of this craft. And even if they wrote, I don't know, Fast and the Furious 25 and you thought it was so bad, whatever, those writers are at the absolute top of this game and are fantastic at what they do. They have to be to get to that level. Um, so it's not to say that there are no bad scripts or there are no bad movies, but just remember how the process works. Remember that this is really collaborative and very corporate and there's it's a movie is like a hundred million dollar company at a certain level. It's a it's a business. It's not just one. It's not a what you're writing is not just a story. It's a proposition to create a business that will move hundreds of potentially hundreds of millions of dollars and employ hundreds of people. So you can see why there's so many cooks in that kitchen and why it's not just like oh this is a good script let's go shoot this. That's just not how it works. There's so many other people that get a, a say in what happens in the story besides you. Um, you're only a piece of the larger puzzle unless, again, you are going this writer-director route or you want to be a novelist, which is why I'm kind of moving a little more in that direction too because a novelist will always have 90,000% more control over the final story than a screenwriter will. So if you're writing novels first or comic books first or something else first and then adapting them, then they, there will be a lot more um, respect paid towards that source material. But even then... Stuff gets changed, I think you've seen, stuff gets changed from the book all the time. So movies just require so many people and so much money to work on them that the writer is not the end-all be-all voice of how everything goes in the movie. It's just, I hate how it's like that, but writers are not fully in charge when it comes to features. 
Um, and uh, unless you're making independent, independent, it's a whole separate world, and you can do both. You can also, you know, do write some independent movies, write some studio movies, but the studio movies are the ones you're going to get paid a uh, significant amount, much more for, for the most part. Um, okay, any other misconceptions on here that I wanted to point out? Oh yeah, once I get an agent or manager, that's it. That's I'm all done. I have a career. I'm I'm rich. <laughs> Time to buy the mansion in Beverly Hills. Uh, no, not at all. In fact, it takes most people several years after they get an agent or manager before they get their first sale or they make any money doing this. And Writers Guild members, which, by the way, it's exceedingly difficult to get into the Writers Guild. It's comparable to becoming a professional baseball player. Um, once you do that, 50% of Writers Guild members do not make any money from writing in a year. This is not a guaranteed clear job with a clear path through it and clear promotions and like guaranteed paychecks or any of that stuff. So you can see why it has historically favored people with a lot of disposable income who do not need to work other jobs while they're doing all this and maybe are younger so don't have big families that they need to worry about or more responsibilities or things like that so you can see where a lot of that comes from it, it's not to say that there's any age or any background you come from that will not be valid to be a screenwriter anyone can be a screenwriter at, at any age but you can just see like it's a long road and it doesn't pay well <laughs> until it does um, so that's the challenge. That's the challenge is partially stamina. This is like a marathon. It's not a sprint. You have to be willing to keep going and keep trying and maybe take a break from it for a while and come back if you're not able to keep up with it for a bit. Um, but this is a, it's a challenge. It's a, it's a really tough career. And that's why script camp is focused on just that first most essential step that most people do not, uh, a lot of people never fully surmount this hurdle of just become fantastic at writing and all these other steps become easier because it's like, how do I network? Well, if you have a great script, then people will want to network with you. If you have a great script, then you can get those meetings. Then you can, you know, you can create opportunities for yourself by being a fantastic writer. It's only diff really difficult to network and get meetings if you don't have a fantastic script. So that first step of just focus on getting really good at writing movies is almost entirely what you should be focusing on. Um, okay, what else? Um, I, we've done enough doom and gloom. I think uh, we don't have to go through all these um, different facts of the career. I'd rather do the fun stuff, but this is just like a general breakdown of the steps to be a feature writer. I think I've gone through this. Step one is the only one I'm really going to highlight here. Get really good at writing movies. And also check, skip ahead to step two. Oh, you did, step two is you didn't really do step one. Actually go back and do step one. Most people try to move to step three and above before they are ready. I tried to do the same thing. I was in college. I was like looking up, oh great. How do, who are all the best agents that I can submit to when I leave college? Um, that is not exactly how it worked and it takes longer than that sometimes. It's really, really difficult. And that first step of just become a fantastic writer is most people will not even get halfway there. So only focus on that one until that one's done. And then you can worry about the rest of these. Um, and we know why this is so difficult. I think we know getting good feedback is really hard, and it's tough to gauge where your skill level is actually at. And a script is just a really long document that you can't really take a cursory glance at and get a good sense, unless you are an expert at it, what works and what doesn't about it. And some people are better at giving feedback than others and better at analyzing scripts than others. People who don't read scripts usually just want to support you, and people who do read scripts for a living almost never want to do extra work outside of the office, so it's harder to convince them to actually give you that time. Um, and a lot of places that will give you that good professional feedback will just cost a lot of money. Not on Script Camp, though. Remember, members do get a huge discount off of coverage. But, you know, for the most part, it's not going to be free to get expert analysis of your stories. Um, and also just that reward part of the art cycle of create, share, reward. It's mostly missing. Most of the time you turn in something, you're like, I can't wait to get my applause. But you don't get any applause. You get what feels like booing because you're new at this and it's not, am it's not amazing writing. And... Um, somebody reads it and they might not even get more than a few pages through the thing that you spent, you know, a year of your life writing. And that's really difficult to only get negative notes um, when you are just starting out because it feels like you just climbed a huge mountain to just finish a single script. And then as soon as you get there, people are at the top booing you. <laughs> They're just booing you for climbing the mountain. Um, and that's tough uh, because you're probably an entertainer to some extent. I mean, we're here because we are entertainers and you're here to work in entertainment and you're here to make things that will make people happy and entertain them and to spend a lot of time making something to make people happy and then to only have them boo it is difficult and you have to get used to that idea um it's like playing the violin like you can't just play a few weeks on the violin and then do a full concerto to people who have paid money to be there and have them stand up and applaud it's just not really possible 
um, you have. That's why I, I encourage you to think of it like that. Like you can bring people to your recitals or whatever, and that can be you know friends and family can read your work, and a lot of them, if they don't have expertise, will just tell you oh, I liked it, or they'll tell you what they liked about it maybe, um, but they won't really have the analysis skills to tell you how to improve it much more. A lot of people might encourage you to give this up just because, well, I mean, they have good reason to. I just went through a thousand reasons why this career just frankly sucks. <laughs> this career sucks. If you can hear that this career sucks, though, and still want to do it, then you are in the right place because you should really be trying to do this because you can't do much of anything else. Not, not because you are incapable of doing anything else. I mostly mean that you can't envision a future in which you are doing anything besides this. Um, like you wouldn't be happy unless you were doing if you were doing something else. So it's fine to have another career, and especially if that career is something t linked to the kind of thing you're writing. People really look favorably upon that kind of expertise that it might provide. If you're, I don't know, a firefighter, and you want to write about a firefighter in your movie, you have a lot that you can bring to that in terms of authenticity. If you're a police or a detective or law enforcement or special forces or something like that, I know very few of us probably are, but things like that are really, really looked at as reasons to... That's why you're the right person to tell police, detective, military, whatever stories, because you have inside knowledge of that experience. That comes That, that is true for everything as well. Look at your background, your the things that you know about due to your upbringing, religion, race, like all these things, they are really valuable and, and we're looking for authentic perspectives especially in tv but in features too so like try to use those things as inspiration and like it's not it's not that you can't do something else and also be a screenwriter or later become a screenwriter in fact those things can really help you um so the reasons to write movies basically you want to be a pro feature writer like i've talked about you want to direct the movie yourself so as in you want to do independent filmmaking you want to just be more skilled at this craft for some reason i guess perhaps for fun um, maybe just a hobby for personal enjoyment but these are basically the this is the list um, like if you want to write just one single movie then send it to the president of Hollywood to get it made this is not the career for you it's really just not how it works um, you can't write just one movie and have it get made you're going to have to write a lot of scripts to get to the point where you will be able to actually get anything even close to being made I've been doing this a long time and well not a long time I've been paid for this since 2017 Nowadays, I do a lot of rewrites and um, polishes on horror thriller films. I've never had a feature made. Um, it's very difficult to get a feature made. Um, so look at these as calling cards, as exercises to improve your skills, things that might be, you know, documents that might be able to get you meetings or might be able to get you results that are not necessarily someone's going to pay you to make this. They might be able to get you a manager who would be able to get you in the room to pitch on other properties. Um, screenwriting is very sort of corporate top down nowadays where it will be like we have the the pringles brand wants to do a pringles movie who wants to pitch on the pringles movie well what's the pringles movie they don't know they want you to come in and tell them what the pringles movie could be a lot of stuff like that you're not going to get paid to pitch on those things but a lot of this is pitching on other people's material but to get in those rooms you have to have that it's that weird paradox of like you have to write something brilliantly original and mind-blowing in order to get in the room to pitch on this recycled corporate crap <laughs> the you know the emoji movies of the world the sour patch kids movies of the world the rubik's cube movies of the world the only people that can get in those rooms to write those very sort of pasteurized and over processed uh types of huge scripts is to ha be an original voice first so that's kind of a big challenge of this um but look at each script as just bricks in the road you are making a road of bricks you don't need to care if any individual brick is a masterpiece. Your goal is to build a road. You should already, like, the question shouldn't be, well, did I really nail it with that one? Was that really good? Did that achieve all my goals? You're already on to the next script. Like, you're, you've already moved on to the next one, ideally. Um, questions about any of these ground rules or preface things before we move into the um, uh, a look at the idea of log lines? Questions about just those basics of the career or any of these things to know before going into this? Okay, no questions. Uh, let's go ahead to log lines. So what's a log line? This is the entire story distilled down to a sentence or so. Um, usually they can go up to, two, or I will say, they can go up to two sentences Almost every time I see one that's two sentences, my first thought is that should be one sentence. So rarely should you be writing a logline that is more than one single sentence. 
Um, it doesn't have to go all the way through to the end. It's basically like you start with the inciting incident, which is the, the catalyst for the story. We are going to say when the catalyst occurs. I, I, I use inciting incident and catalyst interchangeably. That means the same thing. So just be aware of that. So when inciting incident, an adjective protagonist must conflict before or in order to the stakes and ticking clock. So you don't have to go all the way through to the end and say, and then they must learn the blankety blank of blank. It's like, oh, that's the theme. You don't have to say that, therefore, this happens, then this happens, then this happens, and then it ends like this. You don't need to go all the way through to the end. You're basically starting at the inciting incident and taking us up to around the mid middle of the movie, and then just kind of suggesting the trajectory for the rest of it. So we want to imply a story that will be involving visual action or think people doing stuff on screen um it should not be a movie that seems like it's going to be about people sitting around and thinking about stuff or just discussing stuff um unless it's in the context of some kind of high stakes courtroom scenario or something like that in which that discussion might become very dramatic but that's not really discussion that's like discussion is pretty inherently non-dramatic but in a courtroom setting, they're not just discussing the facts of the case. They are trying, they're debating and trying to prove that their side is guilty or innocent, right? So it's different than discussing. We want to suggest this movie is going to be about people doing stuff. Because by and large, movies are about people doing things. Plays are about people talking. Books can be a combination of these things, but it can also be about ideas, you know. But movies are about people doing stuff. And that's the big difference between a movie script and a novel or something like that. In a, in a novel, we're sort of floating in the sky until we settle into a scene. Um, and then we might go back up to float around and settle into the next scene. Or it might be scene, 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 but a movie has to be scene, scene, scene. There's no floating around. There have to be, you have to be very focused. And a big part of that focus is just in Western storytelling, we prefer stories that are centered on a singular protagonist. Um, and almost always you will get this question or this note if it's not clear in the description of the story whose story is this or when the, just this the log line if, if, it's, if it's not clear who this is about whom whom this follows then and how it's about this person changing or this i don't know they might be a dog or a bug or whatever but like this central person like figure um how this this character is going to be tested and this character is going to change in western storytelling there is a very strong emphasis on protagonist driven stories so the hero needs to stay active and it needs to seem like this is this person's tale. And usually, most of the time in features, it's the most important events of their life, at least thus far. Um, that isn't always, always, always true. But generally, the stakes should be as high as they possibly can be for your genre. And if we're doing, I don't know, if it's like a middle school romance movie, then the, the stakes for that are not going to be life and death. It's going to be like my, you know, your the girlfriend and boyfriend break up or something like that. Or it might be they get in a fight. Or whatever the stakes are, it should basically be as high as it can be for that world that they're in. Um, it doesn't mean you need to add a, um, a, a nuclear threat into every single story. It means you need to find what is the deepest, what is the, the highest challenge that someone could face in this genre and in this scenario as is appropriate for, for what it is. And uh, how do I make sure that they are encountering that? They're feeling the highest highs and the lowest lows that your premise has to offer. So in the logline, we want to say... This is going to be a story where you will watch people accomplish stuff that have clear and tangible goalposts, meaning it's we're going to avoid describing things in terms of, like, she needs to come to terms with her father's uh, alcoholism. It's like, okay, when is that actually done, though? That's just an internal process that you've described with no tangible goalpost. A tangible goalpost is something we can see people accomplish. Um, so if you can have dramas that have very tangible goalposts if it's about the relationship between two people one of them is trying to convince the other one to not go to college in a different state to go to college here so that is a tangible goalpost it's not like they have to navigate their complex relationship it's she has to convince her sister not to go to college and that's something you can see if that has happened or not because she crumples up the application and throws it in the trash like we're able to track all kinds of goals through tangible goalposts think of something and i, I was using that example in terms of something like ladybird which is a um a kind of sleepy indie dramedy maybe it's not quite mumblecore but it's close um but it's like a you know a quiet dramedy where the, it's about the relationship between the mother and daughter for the most part and it it hinges around this decision of where is she going to go to college and like is she going to go to the college she wants to get into that is a very tangible set of stakes and a finish line 
for this character in what otherwise would feel like just a movie about, I don't know, mom and daughter are fighting. Like, there's no tangible goalposts in a fight normally. So if you have a conflict, just no matter how social it might be, no matter how internal it might sort of seem, there's always a way to create some kind of tangible external way of tracking that. Think of something like Little Miss Sunshine. It's like a dysfunctional family ensemble. There is a main character, more or less, but it's like there is an ensemble of different family members, all who have their own sort of conflicts going on. Um, and we put them in a car together and say, you have to get from here to there by this time. And that simply gives you a tangible goalpost to a, a story that otherwise would just be people fighting in a room. So you can always find, especially, and movies are all about this, especially in movies should we be finding ways to externalize these internal conflicts and events and make it feel like this should be a movie. This shouldn't be a blog post or a play, or a, um, you know, like a monologue, or something like that. A movie has external action. It has an internal journey that intertwines with the external one, and thus creates, you know, that's what that's what mo movie storytelling is all about. The external intertwining with the internal. Um, so we need to know who's the protagonist, what do they want, what's in their way, what happens if they fail, that's what stakes means. Stakes is just the problem will get way worse if we don't act or we don't accomplish the goal in this clear way. And we have ticking clock, and ticking clock is going to be some factor that is causing your characters to act. It's like adding urgency and motivation to what they're doing because it comes with some kind of clear and visually trackable, usually, um, like, consequences that are approaching for the character. It might be an actual bomb that's, you know, it's we have 20 minutes to solve the escape room to get out of the saw trap or whatever. Or it might be something like, I don't know, your characters are throwing a giant party and mom and dad are coming home early and they're going to be home in five hours and we have to now clean up the entire house and get rid of all the drunk people before mom and dad get back. That's a ticking clock too. So having those elements in the logline is really useful for just establishing what we call the walls of the story. And the walls are going to be those boundaries around where we can go, what we can do, how much time this takes place over, all these things. And certain genres just need clearer walls than others, especially if you have something like a contained thriller. A contained thriller needs to have the walls delineated in the logline really clearly. It's going to be something like, you know, when they wake up in a remote missile silo together, two scientists need to figure out a way to stop a nuclear war before, you know, the end of the day, because that's when the nukes are going to launch and they're going to be blamed for it. Something like that, where it's like we have some kind of really clear thing that these characters need to do before this time. So try to include something like that in the logline if it seems really important, um, or if it's just not implicit in the description of what's going on, then it can be helpful to sometimes to include that sense of a ticking clock, um, or at the very least, the stakes. Um, the stakes being as high as they can be for your genre. Okay, so um, we are almost into our second hour, and in our second hour, we will have t this time to look at a few log lines. So I would start, if you have not already done this, start typing up an early version or just the first approach, first attempt at, the, at some log lines for some of your stories, or maybe you don't really know which one you want to choose yet so you just have vague descriptions of a few of them that's also okay we can start to maybe give you the boost forward into developing some of these and turning them into working functional log lines the goal is to just get your gears turning it's not like this has to be perfect by next week or anything like that because next week is week one right but try to decide at least on the idea that you want to go with today if you can um we can we'll try to give you a push to doing that if you need but um the uh the actual nailed down log line that's like by the end of next, uh, it's either next class or, or next week that we try to get that done by. I forget what the schedule says, but it um, doesn't matter. So for now, just try to get those ideas out. Try to just start shaping your thinking and try to be picking what movie do you want to spend the next two months working on. Um, so I would open up Google Docs if I were you and start just make it, you know, make your brand new document, call it name of movie sketchbook, or just if you don't have a name yet, just call it sketchbook, whatever you want and just start writing down ideas and start as you're listening to the class and as you are in this, be writing down this early version of your idea so that you can get ready to copy and paste it into the chat in probably, I'm gonna say 15 or so minutes, we're gonna share those and you can get feedback on them at their, whatever form they're in, in whatever early stage. Make sense? Any questions so far? Not a lot of questions today. That's all right. No one? Okay. Well, uh, oh, ha hang on. Let me check all the different text chats just to make sure. Uh, yeah, looks like no questions. All right. 
Um, so yeah, start working on those. Um, be ready to post those in about 15 minutes. Let's uh, go over um, a little more about the sketchbook. And um, so as you're making this here, let me just, do I have a slide about making it? No, I don't. That's okay. Yeah. So head to Google Docs and just create new blank document. There's no right or wrong way to do this or no right or wrong thing to include in here. At the top, I would include your logline, your genre, and just, um, or like, you know, an early version of the logline. And just something like the genre, the runtime you think it'll be, so like page count you're aiming for, stuff, basics like that. And then below it, you can include whatever you want. It's a place to collect all your notes and sketches and ideas, pictures and video links from the internet, from your research. Maybe you want to include passages from books that you've read. You want to flesh out your characters and write a full list of characters, especially if you're going to do a story that has a lot of characters. You're going to need to probably create a list of them up top um, and maybe brief descriptions of who each of them are, like a cast list almost. Um, act two scenes or set pieces. So this would be fun kind of set piece moments that you might envision in the trailer. Um, that's stuff that's going to be used to populate your act two, which is the most important part of the movie, the backbone and the meat of the movie. Well, it can't be meat and backbone, but it's the, the, the heart of the movie is act two. We say act two is the movie. So unless you have a couple sequences in mind for what would be in the middle of this, then it's usually not a good idea to pick an idea that you can't Im imagine the middle of. Um, it's nice if you have an idea for the ending at the beginning, um, but these like three to five sequences right in the middle, that's what we want to see in the trailer. We want to see the, the stuff that you promised and stuff that offers some kind of unique thrill within its genre and within its world. So try to pick set pieces and, and start be thinking of stuff that could only work or could only happen in this world. If you're doing a movie about a mermaid firefighter, then you want to make sure that we're doing scenes in the middle that are showing her mermaidness being complicated by her firefighting and her firefighting being complicated by her mermaidness. Look at the two things that are clashing or combined, and that's what is going to often populate the middle of your movie. It's going to be where we see the 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 premise really shine is in those three to five sequences directly in the middle. So try to come up with ideas for what those could be. They don't all have to fit in the movie. They don't all have to work or make sense or be that good, but just try to come up with a bunch of stuff. Other things, you're going to want to brainstorm possible endings because the ending is the point. And the ending is, you know, although the 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 middle is the move, the second act is the movie, but the ending is what we walk away with. So, like, we, we remember how the middle made us sort of uh, feel, but we're going to remember specifically what happens at the end. Um, so that ending is actually really important. Try to pick an ending that is um, as impactful as possible and feels unexpected yet inevitable. That's always what we're going for, unexpected yet inevitable. So if there's, um, you know, if there's going to be, if the whole movie is working up towards this one battle between your hero and your villain, we know that they are going to clash eventually, but it can always unfold in a slightly different way than we think it will. Um, it doesn't always need to look exactly like someone's first assumption would be. And maybe even think of what are your first three guesses for how something like this might go. And then work from there. So think, okay, what's option number four? What's option number five? To avoid that kind of sense of familiarity in the stories. If you find yourself just gravitating towards things that you've seen before or things that you've read before or things that you've seen done before, maybe list out those first three or four things that come to mind and ask yourself, how do I innovate or iterate on that again and make it even more unique and make it even more different. Um, also, coming up with lines of dialogue. If you have lines of dialogue that just spring to your head and, and maybe you don't know which character should be getting this line yet or you don't know which character um, this belongs to, then it doesn't matter. We just need to be trying to figure out the voice of this and what kind of lines are in this world. Like, what kind of... Is this a comedy? In which case, we want to see maybe some ideas for jokes. If this is, um, you know, uh, a really serious drama, maybe we have some ideas for monologues. Whatever it is, just include it in the sketchbook as, as long as... I'm sorry, uh, alongside all of the photos, drawings, and links, and anything else that will just help you research or help you understand this world, the specific rules of it, and the specific look and feel of it. So I recommend if you're doing stories that are set in a country or um, city that is not your own, if they're set in the modern day at least, look up walking tours on YouTube. So um, just go to YouTube and search for that city and then walking tours. And they will, you will find a bunch of really good links of people just walking around with a steady cam. And sometimes it'll have commentary or annotations that will explain more about like, oh, that statue is, you know, built in the 1500s or whatever. But more importantly than that, you'll just get the feeling of someone walking around 
in that place and you get a sense of what that place sounds like and the kinds of stuff that you wouldn't necessarily notice from watching a movie about that place. So I recommend those actually, you know, the walking tour videos, they're like an hour or, or more. Um, but uh, you want to really feel like you can immerse the reader there in the same way that somebody would feel if they were there. So I suggest walking tours and just tour type videos if you are looking to set it in a real modern day locale. Um, especially if it's one that you are not familiar with. Okay, um, so questions on sketchbooks. So it's just like, you know, whatever ideas pertaining to the, the log line that you have. Well, you may not have like, a logline yet. Um, you may. This is yeah, oh, pertaining so to the just, uh, like, just the idea. Yeah. Okay. So you can have. I would. I would use the sketchbook as a place to figure out your logline. I mean, you can write a couple different versions of it to try to figure out what is the best logline to use. Um, but it should just. It's like the document for this potential theoretical movie that doesn't exist yet, where you're going to collect everything. Everything goes into it. Uh, thank you. Sure. Thanks for the question. Anyone else? So as a final um, thought on this, some people really, really, really like to use Microsoft Word or Pages or Notes or other stuff for this. Um, you can use whatever you want, but for the purposes of Script Camp, my rule is we're only linking each other Google Documents or PDFs. Um, and that's to avoid this problem of some people just don't have the software to open Word Docs, for instance, or they um, there will be compatibility issues, or like it's just a better idea to use Google Docs or PDF links. Also, just sometimes people will send a link and we're like, I don't even know what that URL is. That's almost suspicious or fishy that you would send something like to sites that we don't even know, or to download media share files, or like to download links. Uh, it was like download here. This is a link to download my script, and we don't even know what it is. It's like if you just stick to Google and PDF, then that's the, the best way to go. Um, okay, no other questions on sketchbooks or anything we've talked about so far? So Hope says, I'm working on two scripts at the moment, and you have uh, a little bit of a long line there. Okay, great. Thank you, Hope. We'll, um, we'll get ready to post those in just a minute, so we'll be glad to review. Even if you have an incomplete log line, we'll, we'll be glad to take a look in just a few minutes here. Um, other questions on sketchbooks? Okay. Where are we posting stuff? Because I didn't see that message. Oh, um, so there is a, if you mouse over general chat, there is a chat channel attached to the voice channel. So it looks like oh, a little word bubble things. that says open chat. Yeah. It's easy to miss. And it, um, Discord just added it, this feature. So uh, yeah, tr tricky to find. But that's where we're doing chat today. Um, what was I saying? Okay, yeah, so that's where we'll be sharing your log line soon. Let's, um, let's just do a couple more slides, but uh, just be, be writing that early version of the log line in your sketchbook for now. So the next things we'll be doing, I'm just going to give you a glance ahead. You don't have to study this extensively, and you should be writing the log line right now anyway, but let me just give you a little preview. So story beats is what we're going to work on after sketchbooks are done. So that's when you take everything in your sketchbook and start to arrange it under these structural headings because a movie is comprised of a, a three-act structure. I mean, at least in Western storytelling, three-act structure is what we use. Um, and you can start to figure out, okay, I know what what moments have to occur in the story, so you have a couple things you can already put on your plot board or on your outline. You're going to already know a few of those just from having a well-written logline. So from there, you're going to work forwards and work backwards from those things and connect the dots and, you know, reverse engineer the entire story from just those plot points that you have and try to flesh out a clear and uh, coherent version of the narrative. Um, it doesn't have to be incredibly comprehensive until our next week, which is on those scene cards. Scene cards are just an expanded version of the story beats wherein we now have a full paragraph for every scene in the movie describing what happens in each scene. This is the heavy lifting of the writing, and this is where you have to actually make a lot of choices and figure out what is occurring from scene to scene. So if you're used to doing that while 
working on the page and while actually formatting in the software, this might be different for you. This might be challenging to think, I have to do all the hard stuff up front, really, but it will just make writing those pages so much easier. So this is the method I have always used, have always taught, and we've seen a lot of people have really great results from. Just try, just try it. Just try forcing yourself to organize in this way, even if it's not your normal approach, and just see if it works. And more or less, see if it figures, or see if it allows you to finish the movie. That's what the main goal here is. It doesn't matter if it's amazing. You're trying to just get it done. Um, okay, anything else I want to say? Uh, yeah, any last questions before we start um, sharing log lines? Josh says, scene cards made writing my pilot easy. That's awesome. Yeah, that's exactly the intention. I'm glad it worked for you. It's supposed to make the, the actual scenes just effortless, or not effortless, but much, much easier because you no longer have to worry about, well, what happens here or why, or how do I get to the next thing? You've already figured that stuff out. Other questions? Okay, um, let's, if there's no more, then let's, uh, let's look at some log lines. So in the chat, Share whatever you have, or if you just have a few sentences describing the idea that are not even really a logline yet. Whatever it is that you've got, um, now's a chance to share it and get some of that early feedback on it to start shaping it into a more coherent movie idea. So we'll give you guys a minute to post that. And I'm going to open um, a blank document so we can start making notes on them. All right. So um, let's check the chat and see which log lines we have to work with. I'm going to ask that you unmute yourself and be prepared to talk about your idea and express it in as clear and um, concise terms as possible. And uh, just be ready to answer questions. So Hope posted first. So let's start with Hope. If, if you're there, Hope, it looks like you have two different options here one is for a feature and one is for a short is that right yes okay so this is for the feature class i think we would want to look at the the feature idea unless you think the short could also be a feature as well are you saying this the it's definitely one is a feature and one is a short or you're not sure uh yes the first one is a feature yeah okay <laughs> let's take a look at that one then so can you explain the idea and read this out loud to us uh so uh, should i read aloud my log line yeah, go ahead. It's, it's a remarkable story of, uh, like a journey, of a boy's soul who, upon finding his ideal mother, stops at nothing to be born as her son. All right. So, Thanks for this. No. Go ahead. You can talk more about it. Yeah, whatever else you want to say. So it's a narrative story when the soul is telling, like, what happened before he was born. So the first uh, scene, well, not the first scene. So the main scene. The, the baby is born and then he remembers what happened when, when he was like three years before when he was a soul when he just met his mother when he was invisible character just like the way to tell the story but he's real but no one sees him kind of like this okay it's like two two worlds like an invisible world of this soul and mm -hmm. our world of humans sure parents, okay the souls are looking for parents Mm -hmm. You don't see them. And one oh, personal okay. story tells about everything. Okay, um, that's interesting. Um, I think that uh, we haven't seen too much stuff like this, so this does seem original to me. We've seen a little bit. I mean, there was a Pixar movie called Soul that sort of touched on ideas yeah. a little like this, but it wasn't quite the same, so you can do your own sort of take on this. I We should ask, what is the genre that you see? Is this supposed to be funny is this supposed to is this like a fantasy adventure what exactly is the genre here it's like maybe dramedy it's like also with magical realism elements uh, okay is, magical, really. is this animated or live action it's you know what it's also like we told, or i told yesterday it's like it can be half animated i think so these souls can be animated and the human beings it's like real people Oh, okay. So do you see, you sort of see this as like a family movie, perhaps, like um, something like a Pixar sort of tone. 
It's. I don't think it's for the kids. No. You don't think it's for I kids, don't... even though it's about a kid. Yeah. <laughs> There's some very serious topics involved, like abortion and stuff. Okay, I mean, uh, it's uh, normally our, it's, it's, I mean, you can, you can definitely do that. I would think that, uh, half animated adventure starring a kid that's not for kids at all is really rare to see. Um, almost, I don't think I have heard of anything like that. Um, so at least in the Western market, this sort of thing would be marketed for, this would be like a Pixar or DreamWorks type movie for the most part. Um, that's not to say, I mean, for, especially for a boot camp, you can do something, you can do whatever you want, but you should just be aware that's what people are going to expect. They're going to be like, wait, this isn't for kids. <laughs> They're just going to be surprised by that, I would say. Um, so, uh, something to know. Uh, if we're going to say dramedy, I guess that makes sense, or dramedy slash fantasy, I suppose. Um, so what is he mostly doing in the movie? What's the conflict exactly? You say, it's a boy's soul. We... Upon finding his mother, stops at nothing to be born as her son, but what's standing in his way? It's kind of his conflict with himself and society, of his society. It's like it's heaven chancellery, right? So, like, some bosses from above who make some rules, like, for example, if she wasn't be born from this mother, like, at first place, she can't go back to her. And, like, it, he breaks this rule. So, it's like, is it, I don't know. It's like inner conflict. Hmm. Well, inner conflict is the opposite of what we're looking for for movies because that is more for... Inner conflict should, of course, be in a movie, but we're looking for an external journey that can intertwine and interweave with an, an internal one. Um, especially in a movie where you have people flying around as invisible souls, I, I think we want to see them doing stuff. We want to see them with some kind of external, like, tangible yep. finish line um, and some kind of clearer sense of what is this character struggling with? If it's just inner conflict, that's like, what is he doing? Sitting in a room thinking about stuff? No, we no, want to no, have... It's, it's not just... Go ahead. No, no, no. I, I was wrong with explanation. It's not just inner conflict. So there are some bosses make rules, and at the end, he just break this rule. But you know, I don't know. Maybe I just need to think more about like what was in his way, why he couldn't break these rules. So it seems like yeah. he broke it too easy. <laughs> So maybe try thinking, try put, putting it in these terms. Maybe it's more like when inciting incident occurs. So try using the template that I was sharing before. So think of what is the thing that kicks the story off? That would be the inciting incident. So when inciting incident happens, an adjective protagonist, adjective protagonist must conflict before slash or else stakes. Um, and that is going to clarify like, now that this thing has happened, this character must do this tangible journey, like he's got to, I don't know. Um, see, I'm, I'm having trouble picturing, since I don't know the rules of how your world works, I'm having trouble imagining what we're doing in the, in the major or what the characters are doing in the majority of this. But if it's like, mm -hmm. um, think of something like uh, Inside Out, with the, which Inside Out is another sort of animated movie about not okay. spirits, but like they're emotion characters, right? They're like little uh, happiness and sadness and stuff like that are the main characters. Um, they still have a tangible goal to, to achieve. The main character, who, who's happiness, she gets like uh, mm, trapped or separated. She gets like separated from the control room where she's supposed to be to control the girl's body, and she has to make her way back. And that just gives us a really simple goal for the movie. This character needs to get back to this place. So, is the, if this is taking place in a kind of fantasy soul kind of afterlife landscape? then maybe your character has some kind of physical place he needs to get to in order to, like, be born. Or maybe he has to, I don't know, um, maybe he's on Earth and the sort of afterlife ghost cops are after him and he has to find a way to outwit and avoid them and that's how he's going to accomplish his goal. Maybe, like, an antagonist would help. Um, maybe a, a sense of the central relationship would help. Like, your main character needs to team up with another soul in order to both get to their own, you know, bodies or m mothers that they want to be born to something like that yeah. i think we're just looking for more of a sense of a an achievable finish line mm -hmm. just before life not after life right and exactly it can be a good good title before life for the movie. yeah pre-life uh, before life whatever we call it um this yeah. is i think there's a there's some religions at least that suggest that it's the same place right it's like we're all this it's like the world of the non-living and the world of the, the living I, I guess right mm-hmm but every religion has its own 
version of this in every you know many people have spiritual beliefs that are some some different var- variant of this so it's it's something anyone can understand um which is nice and it sort of fits into almost any religious belief which is cool um i would just try to focus this a little more um we can't really say it's a remarkable story in the log line that's kind of the audience's opinion not our opinion so we have to okay. just frame it in terms of it's what story well we don't even need to say it's, we know it's a story we don't even need to say it's a story so frame it in terms of like when this happens when x occurs a and then maybe pick some word to describe the boy like why is this the right boy for this journey is and i don't exactly know what the answer to that is because if you're saying he's a soul that has not even developed yet then like i don't know if he even really has a personality or whatever but why is this the ideal mother what what determines that like why is this the one goal that he has um and we to have to to add that kind of focus might just make us start to be able to envision the character a little more uh, actually, the uh, log line on my uh, book uh, is like, "Who said we can't choose our parents?" Hmm. Okay. Mark. But on what criteria are they choosing? It's just like, like we, we think we can't choose our parents, but we we do choose them before I like, just don't remember about it. But based on what? How are they choosing? Ah, uh, the, this just this personal story and this general idea based on this story. You know? So there is, <laughs> but how do they know who the ideal parent is? Like, is it just a feeling oh, they get? It's just like a sixth sense. They oh. See them and they feel connection. Oh, okay. Well, so it's not even based on anything that they're identifying or choosing on their own. It's just. Uh... No, it's like love. So you falling in love with a girl, you can't explain why. Okay. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Um, yeah. But uh, anyway, hope does that give you some ideas of ways to kind of start shaping this into a log line that will tell us what we're going to watch on screen and like t- give us a sense of what's going to be happening in for instance the middle of the movie like those those set pieces and those sequences from like you know 35 minutes to an hour yeah i think so okay cool so yeah give us a really clear tangible goalpost, uh like an objective that we're like this character needs to do this achievable thing and just give us a little bit of a clear sense of like um the uh inciting incident what causes the story to happen and what happens if he doesn't? Like, what are the stakes? I need to come up with, like, what happens if he doesn't? Yeah, I mean, I guess we can imagine he will be stuck with someone who's not his ideal mother, but uh, is that the worst part of it? Like, he can't, like, is it, or is it something worse? Is it, like, it's if the he... the same thing, like, you're, you're in love with one girl, but you're going to marry to another, which you maybe don't love her in- enough. It's the same thing, you maybe won't be so happy. Not being as happy just feels like pretty low stakes to me, though. Like, uh, if, if there's something else there, then we would want to hear, like, you know, if he doesn't get to be with his ideal mother, he has to be with the worst mother. Or it might be, I don't know, he might be banished from the afterlife or something like that. We, I think we just are usually looking for stakes that feel a little higher than, oh, if I do this, I'll be even happier than if I do this, then I'll be slightly less happy. Um, so if there is something else, maybe something to highlight there. Maybe Pixar will come up with something, but they're gonna make a sequel of this soul. And <laughs> okay. It was published earlier than this, you know, the soul, the soul movie was released. And now I don't know, they're gonna release it in December. I'm looking forward to see what they come, came up with. Yeah, sounds cool. Um, yeah. Alright, so thanks for this. I hope this was um, this was helpful for you. So keep keep working on this. We're looking forward to seeing more. Yeah, you are better right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's uh let's do some more. Um, we have a sketchbook from Josh, and from Gray, and we have um Logan and Haley, and I think that's the log lines we have for now. All right, that should probably take us the rest of class. Um, let's uh start with Josh. Hello. Um, Hi. So this um just. I mean, just uh, came into my brain, and I liked it, and I feel like I could have a lot of fun working on it. Um, uh, my working title, Welcome to the Neighborhood, Horror Comedy, uh, The Burbs Meets Monster Squad. Uh, a newlywed couple discovers their new neighborhood is inhabited by classic horror characters and must survive before the end of their lease. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, so, go ahead. Um, so... I was talking to somebody yesterday, and they asked me what my 
genres were, if I was working, you know, what the kind of genres I like. And I said, oh, horror, comedy. And I meant to have a comma in between there, but they're like, oh, you're writing a horror comedy? I was like, oh, maybe. Mm. And so it kind of just, like, was turning in my head of, like, the different kinds of things I like. I love the feel of the burbs. Um, but I also the, the love how fun something like Monster Squad is. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like I could, A, learn the basics of, you know, the, the structure like I did in Pilot, um, but also do it with something that I just have, I, I know I enjoy, have fun mm -hmm. with. Um, so I could, you know, have fun with all of these classic characters, things that I'm already kind of familiar with, um, and but also have fun with writing a, a, a couple character and, and that, you know, seeing who I want them to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what happens yet at all in my head, uh, other than some, you know, just visions. Um, but yeah. Okay. Do you have well, any thoughts on the log line? Yeah, sure. So a couple is not a main character, so you'll have to pick. It looks like you've said the frame the husband um, just in this character list as probably the sure. main character. So try to frame. It's got to be a person's story, not a, not a couple story. Um, gotcha. And they discover their new neighborhood is inhabited by classic horror characters and must survive before the end of the lease. So they're the, these horror characters are trying to kill them. Yeah, in in the same kind of way that like in the Burbs it's kind of clear to the audience and to Tom Hanks from the beginning that things are not kosher. Um, and by the end of it, you know, the whole neighborhood is involved, his wife is involved, um, and that while maybe it seems like these are just weirdos, it then turns out that you know, no, these are really like that. That's that is Dracula. That is, you know, there's there is a monster in one of these houses, and so on and so forth. And so, yeah, they're trying to kill them. And so, when you say that it's inhabited by these characters, do you mean they are living as normal in, people? Yeah, they are. Okay, so they're all in disguise, basically, or is it like monster style where they just look like Frankenstein no, and stuff, I, just walking around? I think, in, I think it's in disguise. Okay. Um, even the mummy, <laughs> the mummy. Uh, well, I guess. Depends. Well, you know, some some of these characters, it'll be more of like a, well, you know, what's in that house, you know, uh -huh. kind of a thing. Okay. Um, and they're trying to kill the main character's wife. I don't know because that's their nature. Hmm. Um, I mean, I have my main antagonist is Dracula, mm -hmm. and Dracula's main, you know, goal is sucking the blood of the living and so right. on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Um, and he's a good kind of antagonist to have, uh, charismatic and, uh, but also just evil. Mm -hmm. Um, so it may be a situation where, uh, it's just Dracula who's trying to kill them. And the, there's all these other characters, cause you know, you know, Frankenstein's monster isn't inherently evil. So right. on and so forth. Um, yeah, maybe Victor Frankenstein would be a better monster than that. What? A Frankenstein monster, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's not that's not a bad idea. Because then you could also uh, have, oh, maybe he is helping cover up all of the other monsters' antics. He, if you have like a sort of mastermind or somebody who made some of the other monsters or something like that, could sort of start to make sense as to, like, they're organized, right? You're saying they're like a team of monsters. They're like I, all on the same I, side, helping each other hide and blend in. I yeah, I my idea, my my vision of it was that it was like a gated community. Oh, okay, that's a good way to take it, yeah. So in that case, you're, the angle you probably want to go is they're trying to get rid of the humans because they weren't meant to be here, or they this is meant to be monsters only, right? Yeah, or or they they lure, you know, people in, regular people in. Um, that's good, too. I would, I'd write that down. Like, like the, okay, <laughs> uh, I'll write it right now. Uh, they just have, like, a bait house. People in, yeah... Uh, with what seems to be uh, you, you know a, a perfect place to live you know mm -hmm. but they're just grooming uh, them to be victims or servants exactly like, oh, okay. like, uh, like the movie Duplex with Ben Stiller and Drew Barrymore where they're like they finally find this amazing place but the 
the weird old lady lives upstairs and she's obnoxious and maybe she's trying to kill them and mm -hmm. um, something like that where they finally find this beautiful place and they've been searching and searching and searching. And then this, this perfect place drops in their lap. Too good right. to be true. <laughs> yeah. Honey, I got this great deal in this amazing place in a country club. I mean, yeah, they asked for our blood samples before we go there, but like, whatever. <laughs> it was so cheap. <laughs> exactly, um, yeah. This is good. I mean, there's something here. When you start talking about the gated community angle, I'm starting to see the movie more. Because oh, as it, okay. based on the logline, I'm having trouble seeing... Uh, that's why I'm asking so many questions. Just like, help me, help me see yeah. it, help me see it. Because as it is, yeah. I'm like... They move into the Munsters, Adam's family neighborhood, and they have to survive. But I'm thinking, if their neighborhood, if their neighbors are so good at blending in and being humans, then why would they kill their neighbors? Then they, how would they possibly be blending in? But you're saying, if that's part of the scheme, like they're deliberately luring people here to be sort of like the new members of the neighborhood and then killing those people one at a time or, you know, one group at a time. Well, first of all, it's yeah. sort of saying that they only need victims very intermittently. Um, so it might be yeah. that they're being, they're looking for someone to make into servants or, you know, how vampires will have uh thralls things like that um that they yeah, will yeah. they mean for them to do the tr they want th they want new igors basically um and yeah. if they get out of line then they'll be eaten and there's a bunch of other igors in the town oh that could be a good that could be nice to realize as well er all the other people they've met in the town are the previous residents of that really nice house that all were sure. lured in in the same way and now they all yeah. have to serve the monsters yeah, I had this idea of, of an Igor-type character being, like, the security guard. Mm -hmm. That's pretty funny. Uh, or Yeah, we'd think they'd have a bunch if they've been doing this for a while. This is not their first uh, exactly. rodeo. Okay, so I'm starting to see this more. Um, I would maybe start to drill in a little a little closer on frame, framing it around this sort of country club. This is sort of like the evil homeowners association kind of thing, where it's like okay. the people who run the gated community are the monsters, right? Yeah. Or they're at least the dominant members of it. Um, I, I see that a little more. Try to frame the logline a little bit around that. You might call This movie might be called, like, I don't know, uh, HOA or something like that. If you're sort of like, well, what's, I wonder what the secret is with the evil H, you know, the, isn't that what it's called? The group that, that drives around and they're like, your lawn is too long. You have to mow it. You can't plant so. yeah, yeah, yeah. these flowers. Or they just are super really annoying about the country club stuff. Um, maybe that's who it is, and it's like, who are those mysterious people, and why are they only ever out at night kind of thing? Um, but uh, I think there is a lot of potential in this idea, and this sounds pretty funny. It's it's When you first gave me the logline, it sounded much more just like a comedy, and I was seeing, yeah. okay, this is just a comedy with horror scenery and characters and, like, a spookity tone. But if you phrase it like, we have just moved into this new place, and now all our new neighbors have a secret. Now we have to, and like even the people we meet at the grocery store seem like they're up to something. And like we start, yeah. we're slowly unraveling what's going on here, and they start to realize we're in the middle of a web, like hereditary style, like we're in the middle of this trap, um, and we're being, you know, they're closing in. And, th and I could start to see that as more of a horror type tone. So maybe just pick which tone you want to go with, and like emphasize that a little more. If you want to go with mostly comedy, then it could be like I don't know, the monsters have a book club, and now the book club makes the rules in this town, and they're gonna kill you if you don't. Yeah follow them or it might be like a little bit more we're piecing together the mystery of what's wrong with this neighborhood yeah i i would i you know in thinking about how i would tie this up i really like how beetlejuice ends mm -hmm. with them living with the ghosts and with you know with all this stuff and the, all you know it's just they've just now integrated mm -hmm. uh so that's some, you know, something that is just in my head of, of maybe that's where I go to with this in making it more of a comedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love Beetlejuice, so um, uh, I, th I think that's a, a great ending as well. So you can find some way for it to not be one group eradicates the other group. If you can think of yeah. what's option C, what's option D, you know, um, maybe it's they become the new Lord Vamp. They kill Dracula, they become the new heads of the monster club, whatever yeah. it is, you know. So think of option C. Okay. Um, but fun stuff here. I like the basics of this. Any questions? No, I think... Uh, thank you for your feedback. I appreciate it. Sure. Um, and looks like Nacho has linked you a, a pilot called Carriage Hill and Them, which both are somewhat similar territory and might be worth studying. Um, thanks for that, Nacho. Good. Yeah, I, I watched you. Them was on Amazon, and Carriage Hill, I actually don't know if that was on TV, but that's at least a script. Um, all right, let's look at some more. We have half an hour left. Thank you all so far for um, participating in this. I want to pause and just see if we have any questions so far based on anything that you guys have seen or heard. 
or that we've discussed, or based on just we want to know what makes a good logline, anything like this. Any questions? Uh, no questions. I um, I was looking at not just Flint there. Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. All right, let's move on to our next one. Uh, we're going to go straight down. Let's go to Gray, Tale of Wethrid. Yeah, what I have so far is pretty shit posty, but you know, I wanted to just vomit my ideas onto the page. That's the idea. All right, can you tell us mm -hmm. about it? Logine is, upon discovering that her island nation is actually a dormant dragon due to awaken soon, a precocious mermaid embarks on a quest to save her home from destruction. Hmm. Discovering her island nation is actually a dormant dragon due to awaken soon, a precocious mermaid embarks on a quest to save her home from destruction. What's the basics of the quest? What does she have to do? It's like a rock she gets from a witch that she has to put in dragon's throat to keep it from waking up. Hmm. Okay, so it's sort of Lord of the Rings style where it's just you have to take this thing and bring it to that place. Yeah. And I'm thinking maybe the kingdom, like... Perhaps, like, the ruler should have something to gain from the dragon waking up, so maybe she and her friends also have to fight against them. Hmm. Maybe. The king's that, moon. that might make sense. Or if you're doing sort of the don't look up version, right? It might be like everyone's like, the dragon's never going to wake up. Shut up. No, it's not. <laughs> and they have to, yeah, like, yeah. you know, uh, convince people that it's true or fight against them because they, like, don't want to believe it. That could work. Um, I'm into the basics of the idea. I like the, the fact that it all takes place on a dragon, the main character being a mermaid. Um, I can see all these different elements working pretty well just the whole embarks on a quest to save her home thing just feels like a million trillion other movies that i was that's why i'm just like looking for that one little seed of what does that look like or what does that mean here for us but in terms of a log line it does work i mean if you say she embarks on a quest to drop a rock in a dragon's mouth and stop it from waking up to save her home that might be too much like that doesn't actually help us that much either so i guess i'm just looking for one little spark that would make me say, oh, I've got to check this out. You know what I mean? Um, I, I wouldn't worry way too much about that because the logon you have is functional. I, it, to me, it's just like a, a functional meal that I'm looking for a little sauce or a little spice on. But for now, I think it, it's it's functioning so we can look at the rest of the, uh, of the um, idea and... Oh, it looks like you have some drawings on here too. That's great. Okay. Um, so uh, any questions just on, on just... The, what I mean by that little bit of sauce or that little spice, just because embarking on a quest to save someone's home is just kind of non-specific to me. Yeah, that was a problem I was having is like people asking for specifics and saying like, well, does, how does the mermaid, like, why does she live on an island? And I have to say she has stockings and it's like, what do the stockings do? Like, well, uh -huh. you see. And, you know, so I have to find some detail that gives it something unique that doesn't also raise a thousand zillion more questions that people expect me to answer in a look like. Right. I'm not thrown off by saying it's a mermaid who's trying to... I mean, it does, uh, I am under the impression that mermaids would example. usually live underwater. But if you say island nation, I can imagine they live on the coast or they live around the coast and they live near the island and stuff. So I'm not that confused by that. You know, I don't think you need mm -hmm. to include that the detail. That was only one example, though. Right, right, right. But, um, for instance... Uh, I don't think you need to include the detail of how she gets the magic legs or, or things like that. Um, I would just, yeah, think of a way that you can specify what the quest is. Um, or maybe it's it's less that the speak secret sauce is the quest. It's like, doesn't she team up with somebody to do this? Or doesn't she have a team? Yeah, she has her friend. And I can't think of any other descriptor that would fit in a logline aside from her protective friend. Hmm, okay. Um, is her friend also a mermaid? Nope, he's a fairy. Okay. It doesn't well. have any wounds. It lost him in an accident. Okay. Well, having oh a, a crippled fairy or like a I don't know if we would want to say crippled, but a um, a flightless fairy, something like that. Is it relevant to the plot? I is it? No. Okay. <laughs> I'm just looking for that. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes that Maybe the spiciness I can. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Maybe it's he does like have an insecurity about it, which causes him to overcompensate by being protective and trying to be on top of things. But 
that's not okay. the main thing of it all. Hmm. Yeah. Um, so the the sort of this last element, this sort of like spicy sauce or whatever, it can come in many different forms. Sometimes it is this partnership or central relationship, but often only if that implies some kind of conflict between, between them. It's like you know, a werewolf has to team up with a vampire because they're at war, and that's the conflict there, and that's that's why it's interesting that they have to work together to do this larger goal. If there's no actual sort of irony behind a mermaid teaming up with a fairy, then maybe you might not need that. If it's like the I guess we're looking for a point of conflict between the characters if, if you're going to use that as that central point of interest. But I, I wouldn't worry way too much about that. The Lachlan you have is okay. I, I would just continue to develop this and see where it kind of lands and, and be thinking along the way. Is there some way that I can just specify or clarify what the quest is in a way that makes it feel like, oh, I've got to check that out. Like, why would fantasy readers who have read a million stories about people going on quests to save their home, why would they pick this one? Mm-hmm. Um, and there is a little ahead. bit of an internal conflict uh, where all of their lives, like they've known each other, they're both orphans, and he has always been very protective of her. And part of her arc is um, becoming a braver person. It's as basic as it gets, but that's something. Okay. Is that... Um, but, but we would expect a character that has to go on a dangerous, especially a young person goes on a dangerous journey, would have to become braver to accomplish it, right? Unless they were already super brave to begin with. Yeah. And she um, becomes less dependent on him. And he doesn't like it at first, or like, yeah, throughout the movie. But then at the climax, he does something like lets her go and finish like, you know, the quest, even though it's crazy dangerous. Mm-hmm. Because, like, they've realized that, yeah, I am capable on my own. And even okay. though we're best friends, like, it's okay to take a risk hmm. for the greater good. I would probably mention the central relationship in the logline, I'm thinking. if It sounds like that's a really key component to how the story works. Is it okay to have such a basic descriptor as protective friend? Or... I think there's probably something else you can suggest that might catch people's interest a little more. Um, but... If you can't think of anything else, then I I would just throw it on there for now. I think it just sounds like this is a like a central team up that is key to the whole thing. Mm-hmm. So that's my feedback for now. The rest of it sounds like pretty. It's all pretty good stuff, and like I, I think that we would really see this shine in the execution. This is not a this is not a high concept story, um, mm-hmm. but that's okay. It doesn't absolutely have to be. But then. Just uh, just think, how, how would I get someone excited to check this out? How would I get someone to say, of all the things like this that I could read, I'm going to go with that one? Hmm. Yeah. All right. I'll Thanks, Greg. I'll work on the wrong one. Sounds good. Some folks in the chat might have had some ideas for you as well. Um, yeah, there's some... So scroll up a little bit in the chat and you'll see some suggestions, Greg. All right, um, thank you for that. Let's uh, move right along, and we'll go to Logan. Hello? Hi. Connor, can you hear me? I hear you. Um, yeah, uh, I, well, um, for during the class, I also wrote a little little bit of sketchbook ideas, or I guess it's like, yeah, so I can post the Google Doc in the chat. Okay, um, let's, we're mostly just going to look at log lines for now, just because we only have uh, 18 minutes of class, but um, I'm glad to look at sketchbook stuff more during lab if you want to. Okay. Let's do log line then. So can you read this out for us? Yep. So, brainchild, uh, genre... It's a sci-fi drama, but I actually think sci-fi thriller is more appropriate after okay. going and kind of sorting it out a little more. Cool. Um, so, log line. Um, when intelligent aliens land on Earth, a pragmatic diplomat who requires stem cell treatment to survive must discover the aliens' weakness from their captured leader to stop them before their presence and hunger for human brains are publicly uncovered. Hmm. And then prompts our arrival meets the silence of the lands. Whoa. 
Uh, okay. Um, I would not have thought Silence of the Lambs would have been a comp from this based on the logline, but I am intrigued how that might be true. When intelligent aliens land on Earth, a pragmatic diplomat who requires stem cell treatment to survive must discover the aliens... Why does the stem cell thing... Why is that relevant? Um, it kind of gives him a sympathy for like the otherwise um, literally alien motivation of the aliens that they need to consume human brains because it's like he has something that he relies on that is kind of in some people looked down upon by society like hmm. he needs it to be alive and they need to consume human brains which of course human society is like no we don't want anything that needs to consume human brains to be alive really Right. Okay, this just seems like no, a character that... detail I would I would leave out of a logline. Okay. A pragmatic diplomat must discover the aliens' weaknesses from their captured leader. So he personally has captured their leader, or, like, the, um, government, the government has? The government. Okay. The government. So why is the diplomat the one who has to do this? Uh, well, he's just, like, a... Like, he's, like, a diplomat who's expert in negotiating, like, like the closest thing to alien life of other nations. Oh, when you say discover their weaknesses, you don't mean like doing autopsies on them. You mean oh, discover yeah, their. There's other, like, help... Yeah, there's other helpful character like negotiate with them. Like the aliens not. Oh. To... That's like kind of like where the arrival um, sort of. I mean, very few opponents that you capture will reveal their weaknesses after enough interrogation, but I guess in theory they, they might. I mean, but most of the time this would be. If, you, if it is a negotiation that's... If you say he's discovering their weaknesses, I'm imagining autopsies and, like, slicing them up and doing tests on them. And I'm like, why is a diplomat doing that? But you're saying it really is... This is diplomacy that they're... Enga or this is um, negotiation yeah, maybe, that they're engaging in. Maybe motives is a better I thing. But, I like, kind of the hook there is, like, oh, their motive is to hunger for human brains if they're coming to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, which is revealed... Like, that's not revealed in the setup. Mm -hmm. I kind of thought of. Um, so a, pre a diplomat it, must, must convince the leader to do what? Um, um, so there's like other a aliens going around that aren't captured that they also landed in like separate drop ships or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and only this one was found and captured, and they're like eating people and stuff. And How is diplomacy gonna win the day here? Um, like, he needs to know how to stop them. And the Brady and the aliens will tell him how to stop them? Um, yeah, so he can... In exchange for food. In exchange for food? Or, otherwise he's gonna die. But, I guess I'm not seeing this as it's something that... A, is this, this is like a series of... Are they torturing... They're, they're torturing the aliens? Is that what you're saying? This is like, essentially a series of interrogations in which they're trying to i'm just struggling to see what if like if they if they if let's say russia captures the top american general and they're like now that we have you in captivity tell us how to beat the u.s what would that top general even say <laughs> nuke us i don't know like I, I, i'm I, how is this setup working so that we have well, someone in captivity who if he just tells us the right thing um, then we can kill them all i guess like in this um um, in this like specific alien either his personality or culture it's not like as like uh, inherently loyal as um, you know like you would assume the average high level general is to uh, their country like mo I would assume most of them by default would die for their country instead of revealing information but why are we or, so convinced there's one thing that we could learn that would help us beat them um, well, at the beginning, it's more just like, oh, why are you here? What are you doing here? Eating brains, okay. <laughs> yeah. But so, is it like, is there, this is what I'm thinking. So, I think you need something that's really clear that this interrogation, or this, whatever, I, basically is an interrogation if you're doing Silence of the Lamb style, right? Um, yeah. I think we're looking for something that they, an answer they would be able to give us to some clear question. It's like, the aliens can't die. We don't know how to even kill them. You know what I mean? So, like... Or it could, might be they have impenetrable force fields, yeah. and, and we just need to know how to disable the force field around their main base. Something tangible, you see what I mean, that can that we understand, okay, this is a secret that he could indeed learn. 
Because if it's just a war between, I don't know, the, the, the general would be like, shoot us with guns? What do you mean? Like, <laughs> win the war, outmaneuver us on the battlefield and shoot us. Uh, there's no trick to it. I think there needs to be some kind of trick to it for us to understand the logline. Yeah, okay, okay. So it's like when seemingly um. invincible aliens, or invisible, I don't know, when it was seemingly invincible aliens land on Earth, a pragmatic diplomat must convince their leader to reveal how to kill them before their, we don't need their presence, before their hunger for human brains is publicly uncovered seems like the least of our concerns. It's before they exterminate us, right? Well, right now there's only like five. The midpoint is that, oh, he reveals, oh, there's like a huge fleet of them coming. Well, why would we assume there was only, yeah, I mean, why would, it's an invasion force, right? Are you saying these are just like the scouts at first? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So then, well, what no, is actually, the um, is the guy, crux of the plot? Then go ahead. Like, I didn't put this in the logline because it's just like you know too much of a um, long detail to put in. But this guy is more like um, like he's not part of like the military force. He just came because he was home. He just came all the way to Earth from his distant galaxy because yeah, well hungry. they're all, they're all like starving. Okay, that's kind of cool. And dying. They've eaten all the brains so locally. Like, so like, now so it's time like, for maybe, more brains. Maybe, maybe in their world, like, they're like, okay, we're going to send the military to go invade first, and then we can all feast on the humans, right? And the, mm -hmm. But this guy was like, I'm too hungry. I'm going to go before the military. Mm -hmm. So and I think if... For military scouts or... If the stake is six or something, the stakes sound like it might actually be then how we, we need to convince this captured alien to call off the invasion. Or to stop the invasion isn't that kind of like yeah. if the current force there does not threaten humanity and the stakes are really that humanity might get wiped out then what your main character is trying to do is stop the invasion from happening i think mm -hmm, yeah okay I, I think that's really more along the lines like of what you want to like, highlight uh, midpoint raise of the stakes okay but if that's where it goes we that's still i would i would frame it like that so okay. trying to stop in an invasion and save humanity. Not before their presence gets uncovered. Who cares? Like, <laughs> that we care that Earth will be wiped out or that all humans will have their brains eaten. That's the actual stakes. The stakes aren't, oh no, the media knows. Um, but I like the set. Now that I've dug a little deeper, I do like the basics of it. Having the whole, you know, dangerous captured prisoner that we need to work with to fight another bad guy is always a very cool trope ever since Silence of the Lambs really kind of knocked it out of the park. So I think there's some cool stuff here. And the title is awesome. Yeah, um, so I would just add that clause to the end of this. Uh, yeah, and also maybe clarify like the thing I said. If they're if it seems like they're invincible, or if there's just some secret, there's some trick to beating them, you're going to want to highlight what is that thing that we're missing. Why can't we just beat them? Why can't we just shoot them with nukes and have that be... like? Why do we need to do this interrogation? Yeah, I think it's also like just a pretty... Um, like It seemed like it would be a fun premise scene if there's like... You know, we take everything that is meant to exterminate humans, guns, uh, acid, whatever, all the stuff that we think, oh, humans, this just destroys humans, and just none of it works against the aliens, because they're obviously just so physiologically different. Sure. And, like, you know, that's kind of, like, a common thing, so you know, like, lots of things as well, right? Yeah. Bullets just make them stronger. <laughs> Whatever it is. Um, so yeah, that's my advice for that one. We're going to move on just for time, but um, nice stuff there. Keep keep working on this. Try to just clarify this one a little bit and make sure that we understand what are the stakes and why are we doing this. Yeah, all right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we got a couple more, and uh, I will stay a little late if we need to run over and just make sure to cover all of them. Nacho also has a comment for you in the chat, Logan. Um, all right, let's go through our last, it looks like two or maybe three of these. We have Haley with a musical. Oh, great. We have, uh, no one writes musicals on here, even though I taught a whole musical class. So about time. Did you? Yeah. Where, where, I, do you have a video for that? Because I would love it. Because I really yeah. want to write this as a musical. We have a great video of it. I'll link it to you after. Well, thank you so much. Okay. So right now, working title, A Little Witchy. It's a feature family musical. Um, a single mom of three little witches accidentally moves into a hyper-controlled uniform community, which upon discovering their magical abilities, tries to force them from town. Hmm. Okay. And so this is, this is kind of a mashup of like the movie Practical Magic, Newsies, Disney Zombies, 
I really, um, I wanted to actually, I'm uh, sorry, go ahead. What are your thoughts? <laughs> oh, um, no, you can clarify a little more. I'm still reading it. I'm still like uh, getting it into my head. Okay. okay. A single mom of three little witches accidentally moves into a hyper controlled and uniform community, which upon discovering their magical abilities, tries to force them from town. Okay. So it's like, um, it's, uh, they move into, is this a world where everyone knows about magic and stuff? Um, yes. And I, I originally, I originally thought about this as like a religious community, like, and, but I don't know if it necessarily needs to be. It's just a, this is like a no magic zone. This is where the community has decided, no, like magic is bad. We don't do that here. You're not, you know, we don't want your type here kind of thing. But through the course of the, the movie and the, you know, the musical, it's, it's people, or recognizing that there's magic all around them. And then Mm. just because they're choosing not to see it doesn't mean it's not there. And then actually that it's not just magic, but it's, it's kind of a, the female, uh, through it, it's like magic becomes more people who start seeing it more because they are becoming more aware of it. And then also that they're recognizing that it's, it's, um, like the female magic that's actually been really suppressed. And so the, the females of the town kind of unite at the end to, um, go against kind of the patriarchal control that's been over the town and they all get to be witches too or do, can someone can yeah, anyone learn yeah. to be a witch or is it like blood yeah. based or so it... and actually the whole yeah so actually what the my thought process is is that the in this particular family you know it they they call it being a witch but in it's actually the same elements are basically in every religion mm-hmm. um they're just called different things and they're so that's what i kind of want to tell <gasps> oh shoot i just stepped on my cat i'm sorry oh, no. um <laughs> i want to highlight that in that okay but you just call it something else like mm-hmm. you praying or you manifesting or whatever is the same thing as me saying a spell is the same thing as you know what so that's kind of what i wanted to show through this so that Everybody has the ability. We just call it different things, and it's up to you whether to tap into it or not. Right. Okay. So this is all pretty strong stuff. I mean, this feels like something that you would see on Disney Channel or, like, um, kind of, like, the kids doing magic genre is, like, you know, we, we see this in, in mostly kids or family-type um, spaces, and that's what this seems to be. So this is, you know, your Hocus Pocus and stuff like that. Yes. Um, which is all fine. Um, my only question is sort of how does the main character tackle this problem? Because you have this, you have the setup, and the setup's great. Single mom, three kids who are all magic. They move into a neighborhood that realizes their magic and now needs to, wants to get rid of them. But does your main, in your main character, we lock, a lot of the time in a log line, we want to see a sentence that's like, and your main character must blank before blank. You know what I mean? So instead of phrasing it like, which upon discovering their magical abilities tries to force them from town, keep the focus on your main character. So it'll be like, so, and when her family is discovered, she must blank and blank. See, see what I mean? Because that could be, uh, okay. she decides we've got to kill the town leadership by tonight. That would be like a horror version. Or it could be, right. we need to organize a big uh, performance to show off our magic to the world. And that might be kind of like a musical version. Or it might be, you know, just think of like, do they start a club for magical kids after school? Like, what is it that the main character does to sol- specifically to try to solve this problem? You don't have to get into tons of detail. But we just want to know, like, what is what are we going to be watching them do to solve this? Because right now I'm just imagining they go to school. People are, like, bullying the kids. The kids fight back against the bullies with magic. Right. They get in trouble. They, a mob surrounds the house. Like, is that what we're doing? Or is it going to be more like we decide to uh, create a an after-school program called, you know, Magic for Everybody? Or, like, how, how are they going to address the problem? How is the, specifically the main character going to address the problem? I see it as the main character um recognizing so to me it's the mom who's kind of the glue of all this right so the mom recognizes that there are other children that are being oppressed and you know abused within the community to repress them and so she recognizes that it's not just about saving her children or protecting her children it's about protecting the other children and so in it becomes this to me, I don't. In the end of Newsies, there's like this moment where all the children unite, mm-hmm. and then they, you know, and that's what I see that as is like this literal gathering of all of these children and coming to the adults of the community saying, "Do you recognize you're rejecting us?" And so it's that moment of the the adults having to choose between their beliefs and or rejecting their children. Okay, that's great. So she is recognizing other potential magic users in the town who have been have it like had it like beaten out of them or whatever right Um, Mm -hmm. and and as a result she's trying to 
get them all in like i would i would think what does she do to try to convince i, I was just throwing out suggestions like she starts an after school program because for gifted youngsters okay. you know like a gifted program something specific yeah if it was if the, this the title might be called the gifted program and it's about you know her way of doing this is she's going to try to secretly tutor these magic kids after school in which case you might even want to reduce the number of kids she has to just one or something if it's going to be more about her relationship to these new kids that she's having to convince okay um but just just some ideas there just uh, some ways to add that extra level of specificity and like um a sense okay. of what we're going to be watching the characters do because because the basics are there now we're looking for the okay but how does she solve the problem kind of thing okay thank you questions on this mm -mm. awesome thanks Haley. mm-hmm <laughs> Okie doke. Um, looks like we have... Is it one more? Marcus? Is Marcus here? Is Mar yeah. It's... Yeah. And it's... it's. Uh, I put two in there. There's one that is the AI robot nanny, mm -hmm. um, which I've been working on and I got behind in the last class. But I'm really far ahead on that. Really far along on that one. Or there was another one I just had about you know, if it's not allowed to do a, an old idea, this rom-com I was thinking about with this um, couple that tries to go back and prevent themselves from ever eat, meeting each other. <laughs> um, it's not that you, you can do old ideas. I just recommend people choosing newer ones uh, for the most part. But if you, if you, which, if I can't even say a sentence, if you'd like feedback on this one, I'm glad to give it. I think the robot in anyone sounds awesome. I, I remember already giving feedback on this, and this logline is pretty um, streamlined. So I'm, I just kind of want to see that. <laughs> the nanny okay, who perfect. has to. I love how you phrased it. In it, ha it's an internal journey, but with such external goalposts and stakes. She has to resolve murderous urges inside of her, inside of her, before she kills the family. Is so clear. So I just love that, and I think that I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that. Um, but maybe I can get Perfect. feedback on the other one for now. Um, couple things. The reason I don't, I suggest people not doing time travel is because it comes with all kinds of problems. And I can already start to identify a big paradox in the inherent nature of the conflict here. The romantic comedy about a couple who goes back in time to prevent themselves from meeting each other. Then why did they go back in time if they prevented that? You know what I mean? Have you seen The Time Machine? The, the movie about the guy trying to prevent, or it's a book, Jules Verne book, but about a guy trying to make a time machine to go back and save his wife from getting killed. And then he finds out no matter what he does, every time he tries to go back and stop it, her getting killed, she dies some other way. And he learns from like this Time Lord guy that explains to him, he's like, you can't go back and stop the thing that made you invent the time machine in the first place, or else you never would have invented the time machine. You know, they kind of face that paradox like the third act turn. I was thinking that like the, the plot point too is they find out throughout the story they end up actually not wanting to break out and now they're trying to stop their original plan to prevent themselves from like getting together oh but now gosh. they realize <laughs> if they do get together then only one version of themselves can live the ones that went back in time to stop it or this new future version because it's kind of been messing up and they keep coming together anyway throughout the whole story and then it's kind of like Spoiler alert, at the end, the couple that went back in time kind of dies off. They sacrifice themselves for the couple that they've kind of interfered with, but is still going together. You know, and then at the very end, they'd wake up together, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But it was a lesson about, like, working together can bring you together or something like that. Okay. I mean, there's there's some good ideas in there, and yeah, I will just say that's going to be incredibly challenging to pull that script off. Um, especially with the, because that involves mul a couple of the different things that I warned against combined into one time travel, multiple copies of the same characters going around paradoxes and like all these things that I would just save this, save this one for a little bit, maybe in like a couple more scripts, you, you can like keep workshopping it and coming and like streamlining this as much as possible. I think for us, a, a script camp boot camp though, don't do this one. Okay. Yeah. I was even thinking the first question I was thinking, Oh, what, where, where, what, era would they go back to 90s 2000s and already yeah. i was thinking oh, you know <laughs> decisions yeah right especially if it's the recent past then you start to run into stuff like all kinds of things would be like especially if people are time if like it's it's one thing if you're time traveling back to the sumerian empire then you don't really have to worry about paradox you know for the purposes of the story it's not like you're gonna run into your own mom right but for a recent time travel story like primer or something like that the complication will just like you will you will it will make you so, it'll drive you crazy to try to keep it straight. 
<laughs> I believe that. So okay, thank you. <laughs> but it's it is cool. Like I believe that there somebody could write a great movie like this. I just think for script camp, I want to see Robot Nanny. There we go, Robot Nanny. It is okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, thanks, Marcus. Hope that's helpful for now. Alrighty, um, that is going to be the end of our class for today. Um, this was week zero, so if you want to be in more of these and you want to keep working with us and write your whole movie in eight weeks, then sign up for Script Camp at scriptcamp.net slash membership, or you can buy the course on its own if you don't want to be a member, but you should be a member because it comes with a two weeks free trial and unlimited classes of any kind you want, so you should definitely be a member. Um, and then we're going to be meeting at the same time slot for the next eight weeks to write this movie from beginning to end first half is prep second half is writing every class meeting you will be taking it there will be two hours of lecture and interactive stuff and then in between classes you will be working on your outline then working on your scene cards then you'll be writing pages like four ish pages a weekday in order to keep up with the benchmarks of the class any last questions before we wrap up All right, if there's no questions, um, you can email Connor at scriptcamp.net if you want to ask something else or use many of our or any of our uh, multiple Discord chat channels to engage with the other students or to clarify things for Script Camp. Um, for next week, try to just settle on your idea and work on refining the logline and the story elements that you have and maybe start to fill out that sketchbook as much as you can. Looking forward to more. Thanks so much, guys. Um, we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.